Welcome back to Student to Stud. In this episode, we'll go over fifth metatarsal fractures and everything you should know as a medical student. Here's the basic outline and what we'll cover in this presentation. Time for our first case. What do you see? We have three views of the right foot in a skeletally mature individual demonstrating a non-displaced fracture of the proximal fifth metatarsal. This is referred as a non-displaced pseudo-Jones fracture. Fifth metatarsal fractures can occur from direct trauma or indirect trauma. Indirect trauma is the most common and is usually due to an inversion type injury. You can have a fracture due to repetitive microtrauma which causes a stress fracture. You can actually have anatomic foot deformities that predispose you to fracturing the fifth metatarsal, such as a cavovarus foot, having your hind foot in varus, or having genu varum or bow legged. When examining a patient with a fifth metatarsal fracture, they will complain of pain over the lateral forefoot, pain with weight bearing, they will have pain with resisted foot eversion, and they can have ecchymoses and edema over the proximal fifth metatarsal. The fifth metatarsal is prone to nonunions. This is because there is an avascular zone. The proximal aspect of the fifth metatarsal is fed by the metaphyseal arteries, and the mid to distal aspect of the fifth metatarsal is fed by the nutrient artery. The area between these two vessels is known as the watershed area. This area coincides with the Jones fracture, which we will see in future slides, has the highest rate of nonunions. Remember in orthopedics, blood supplies everything in regards to fractures healing. There are three structures that attach to the fifth metatarsal. At the proximal tubercle, the lateral band of the plantar fascia and peroneal brevis attach. The peroneal tertius attaches at the junction of zone 2 and zone 3. There are two main accessory ossicles that you should be aware of that are in close proximity to the fifth metatarsal and can be easily confused as a fracture. An ossicle is defined as a very small bone. The os vasalianum is an ossicle in the peroneal brevis tendon and the os peroneum is a sesamoid in the peroneal longus near the proximal fifth metatarsal but is adjacent to the cuboid bone. You always want to ask yourself, is the patient having pain where the abnormality is? If they are not, you need to understand that this could be a normal variation. You need to order three views of the foot, an AP, a lateral, and an oblique. Like always, you can order a CT scan or an MRI. An MRI will be most helpful for ruling out an occult fracture. The Jones classification is used to classify fifth metatarsal fractures. Zone 1, also known as the pseudo-Jones fracture, is the most common fracture. This fracture is approximately 93% of the fractures of the fifth metatarsal. It is defined as the fracture of the proximal tubercle. Most will be treated with protected weight bearing. You can consider surgical treatment if the fracture is displaced greater than 2 mm with angulation. Zone 2, also known as the Jones fracture, is a fracture at the metadiaphyseal junction and where there is a transverse fracture line that enters the 4th and 5th intermetatarsal facet. These fractures have a high risk of nonunion without surgery at approximately 15-30%. to 30%. You can treat most people in a short leg cast for 6 weeks with progressive weight bearing at 6 weeks. You can consider surgery with an intermedullary screw in the elite athlete and of course patients that develop a symptomatic nonunion. Zone 3 is where stress fractures can occur. This area starts at the end of zone 2 and extends 1.5 cm distally. This region is the proximal diaphysis. The non-union rate is quite high at 15-30% to 30 without surgery. The same treatment algorithm is used with these fractures as with Jones fractures. When caring for patients with these injuries, you may see that patients will say that they don't have any pain or tenderness, but their x-rays will not show union of the fracture site. It is important to provide reassurance that these fractures are notorious for doing this and that you should hold off on returning to your sport or activity until there is radiographic union to prevent potential complications such as refracture. There is one more classification you should be familiar with known as the TORG classification. This classification is used for stress fractures of the fifth metatarsal. This classification uses the amount of sclerosis to define the age of the fracture and the healing potential. Type 1 is acute with no intramedullary sclerosis, sharp margins, and no widening. 
Type 2 is a delayed fracture with widening of the fracture line and intermedullary sclerosis. Type 3 is a non-union with an obliteration of the intermedullary canal. When fixing these fractures surgically, an incision is made laterally proximal to the styloid process of the fifth metatarsal. The dissection is over the fascia of the abductor digiti quinti muscle. The short saphenous vein and sural nerve are at risk with this approach. When using an intramedullary screw, you want to place your screw high and inside adjacent to the cuboid articulation. You want to place the largest diameter screw at least greater than 4.5 millimeters. You want to use a solid partially threaded screw and make sure all threads cross the fracture site. The typical screw length is between 40 to 55 millimeters. The fifth metatarsal is curved, so if you place a screw in the mid shaft, it can cause distraction of the fracture and lead to a varus angulation. After you place the screw, the patient will be non weight bearing for one to three weeks and return to activities at six weeks if the patient is pain free and there's radiographic evidence of callus formation. You can use a plate and screw, but this is usually only reserved for non union cases or revision cases. To confirm proper alignment of the metatarsal head, you need to use La Livre's parabola to determine the normal curved cascade. This makes sure that the length of the metatarsals are restored. If there is any malalignment, this can create high pressure and result in pain and callus formation. There are three main complications when treating these fractures. Non-unions can occur, especially in zone 2 and zone 3, like previously discussed. Additionally, if you use a small diameter screw, this can be a risk factor to developing a non-union. When you treat cases with non-unions, you will likely use bone graft and repeat your screw placement. Refracture is a possibility. Fixation failure can occur with an over-eager athlete who returns to their activity prior to radiographic union. Remember that clinical union occurs prior to radiographic union. It is common for patients to be pain-free at six weeks from the time of injury, but their x-rays will demonstrate only minimal amounts of callus. We will discuss one more case prior to jumping into some pimp questions. How would you read these x-rays? We have three views, oblique, AP, and lateral, of a left foot demonstrating a fifth metatarsal fracture at the metadiaphyseal region in a cabovarus foot. This patient was treated with an intramedullary partially threaded screw with a calcaneal osteotomy. Let's now finish our discussion with some pimp questions. Question 1. What zone would be involved with a fifth metatarsal tuberosity avulsion? Zone 1. What is the preferred treatment for an elite athlete who sustains a Jones fracture? Intramedullary compression screw. How many weeks do you typically keep a Jones fracture non-weight bearing when treating non-operatively? 6 to 8 weeks. Are Jones fractures intraarticular or extraarticular? Intraarticular. What classification for fifth metatarsal fractures defines the fractures based on their chronicity? The TORG classification. What is the starting position for intramedullary screw of the fifth metatarsal fractures? High and inside. When you see a zone 3 fracture, what should you evaluate? Biomechanical abnormalities such as genu varum, cavus foot, or hind foot varus. What two structures insert on the tuberosity of the fifth metatarsal? The lateral band of the plantar fascia and the peroneal brevis. What nerve is at risk during the lateral approach to the fifth metatarsal? The sural nerve. What is the percent of Jones fractures that go on to non-unions when treated non-operatively? 15 to 30 percent. Why do we choose to treat Jones fractures with an intramedullary screw in an elite athlete? Faster time to union. What should you ask yourself when you see an abnormality on radiograph that you were not expecting? Is the patient having pain where the abnormality is on x-ray? An elite athlete comes in postoperatively after undergoing an intramedullary screw for his Jones fracture and states he is having no pain and ready to go back to play. What do you need to do before allowing this athlete to go back to their sport? You need to check the radiograph to confirm radiographic union. Remember, clinical union occurs before radiographic union. 
What is the potential complication if you let an athlete back to play prior to radiographic union? Fixation failure. You can have refracture or non-union. What is the treatment for a non-displaced pseudo-Jones fracture? Protected weight bearing. And that's all for fifth metatarsal fractures. Until next time, thank you for listening and hopefully that was helpful. Be sure to give us a thumbs up or leave us a comment so we can better serve you.